you tell me what, what else is on the menu, please, sir, for today. This is the second act amplifier. Not to be confused with the first act, they look like this. No, this one's the second act. Version two of the second act, which is even more confusing. Maybe someday we'll look at the first version of the second act. But for now, we get this one. Here's what's going on inside here. Two off-the-shelf LM386 modules and a couple of capacitors and a voltage regulator on a board. Now I built this amp while it was being used in this video, which was a pointless video. It doesn't explain anything. It doesn't even say anything. It's just some music and me doing this in fast motion. I would explain exactly what each of these pots do, except for I don't remember what they do. I don't think I ever knew what they did. I was just kind of goofing off without a plan when I made this. So the one in the middle controls the voltage out of this regulator, and other than that, your guess is as good as mine. So this amplifier's most notable feature is that it sounds terrible. I mean, just garbage. You can't get it to play clean. About three quarters of the possible combinations of settings yield motorboating and squealing, and the other 25% lead to an unpredictable level of distortion and loudness. This is the worst guitar amplifier that's ever existed, hands down. So I've taken out everything that was a problem, and with what's left in here, we get to, you know, modify this into a much better working amplifier. That's the goal here. Here's the stuff that was in it. Here's the bottom side of that board. You see, I've kind of just got wire soldered on random places. I don't know what's going on here, man. Like I said, like I didn't explain it in the other video and I don't really remember. I was just kind of playing around putting shit together. There's like three seconds maybe of demonstration in that video. That's it. So we're not putting any of this crap back. And what are we going to do to make this amp worth a shit? You know? It's got whatever wattage this speaker is. I don't know what this thing's ratings were. What was it? 5 watts? 10 watts? Power consumption, 26 watts. It doesn't tell you it's power output because it's considerably less than 26 watts. I'm going to say about 5 watts, probably. And then, of course, we downgraded it to 1 watt using this setup. If you're really lucky, you can get 1 watt of terribly distorted audio out of that. Uh, I mean, this speaker will probably handle 10 watts, I'd say, you know. But we're not going to drive it with 10 watts. No, we're going to drive it with whatever we're able to get out of this tube. We're going to use one single... 12AU7 as the power amplifier. Of course, it's not going to be able to do the job all by itself. We'll also be using one 12AX7. We have a surplus of these 24 volt transformers. Of course, we figured out a way to adapt two of them to power a vacuum tube amplifier. This transformer right here is the one I fixed in that parts autopsy video. We're going to take our 120 volts from the line in so this transformer is going to step it down to 24 volts or so, which is going to go straight back into this transformer, and it's going to come out of these wires at various voltages, and the one we're going to tap off of is 240 volt. We'll rectify that, and it'll give us 320 volts DC or so, and that's perfect for driving these tubes. Here on the breadboard, I have one 12AX7 and one 12AU7. driving the speaker from the first act amplifier through a couple of power transformers out of something. It's got a gain control, a volume control, a treble control, and bass control. Down here is an orange and blue jumper that if you move them one space to the left represents closing an overdrive switch. And here it is playing All Hell Let Loose by Grim Reaper. I've got the volume turned up, but the gain is turned way down, and if I turn the gain up, it gets all distorted. As you would expect. The treble control does treble. That's pretty cool. And the bass control does bass. noticeable on this little camera but then again what's noticeable on this piece of shit camera so I cut a couple of holes in the little chassis put some tube sockets and I mounted the transformers 
got the audio transformer zip tied in place right there and they got these tie strips in here to mount all the components. I removed this little circuit board from the little two back ports. Cut the pins off. Now they're almost like a normal jack. I feel much better about putting them back now. I gotta put all the wires in before we put any of the little components because the components are gonna be in the way of the wires. Uh, that's how it looks with just the wires and the rectifier. So with that done, we can power up the chassis and clip on a few alligator test leads, power the breadboard, verify it all works, fine tune it, get the last couple of capacitor values down and put in this mixer pot here that allows you to have a low impedance input for music off of a device separate from the high impedance input for the guitar. So now it has five pots, so the front's all filled out. That's cool. Now we draw it on a piece of paper. That's the schematic. If you want to nitpick it, there it is. I know there's plenty wrong with it. The power supply schematic is here. So then based on those, we drew this little diagram that shows where I'm going to connect each component on all the little tie strips and tube sockets. And this material list. So those are the parts you need if you want to build one of these. So with this stuff figured out, now we can assemble the chassis. Um, but we are missing one tie strip for that because in the neatest schematic of the whole bunch, this is the low impedance input where it ties in. I won't explain it because it's so intuitive. Anyway, we're going to put a tie strip right there on that transformer mounting nut. So now I've assembled all the components that I need to solder together the chassis, except two. That'll be here in a couple of days or whatever. So that because it's missing some components. The grid drop resistor for V1B is missing and the resistor and capacitor that goes across the overdrive control is missing. We used these as standards. That's supposed to go right about there and this other one is supposed to go somewhere in this area connects to that pin way down there. So I can still get to it to solder it and stuff. Eventually the parts will show up and I'll solder it together properly. So I've put this dial in the center. That's a 250k pot and it's right across the first overdrive control where I was thinking about putting a switch. Now it has variable overdrive control and there's still a switch for overdrive too. The power amp overdrive which isn't as effective. It's going to go to a toggle switch. And then this red and black wire here our 24 volts AC power for indicator lights whenever we decide what we're doing about that. That is base and that is trouble, so that's confusing. But this thing turned out pretty good, right? I'm happy with it. It sounds great. Like it sounds better than this video can really do justice for you. Just have to take my word for it. As it turns out, a 12AU7 makes an okay guitar amp. It's not very loud. You need a nice sensitive speaker like that one and it's reasonably loud. If I was running something like this over here, this isn't very loud. It takes a lot of power to drive that speaker. It's not a good match for this. This puts out a half a watt or so. With full distortion, you might get one watt out of it. The design ended up being really modular. These two tie strips ended up being the input output. That is the input pin. That's the input pin post preamp that's the input pin post overdrive control and that's the input pin post gain control over here these two wound up being the tone section 
the tone controls both hook up to it, the volume control hooks up to it, the treble peaking capacitors and stuff. All of the things on those strips is related to the sound of it. So, what do you know? Of course, that tie strip there in the center is just the power. Four silicon diodes making a little rectifier and the filter, the two caps and the resistor. There's another filter over here with that 47K for the preamp stage. Yeah, we cheated. We used diodes. We don't really care. It's not about where we get our power from. It's about where we get our sound. Over here is the mixer on this tie strip, and that's all that does. It just mixes the guitar with the input music from the back jack. Also pretty convenient that a little 6 volt lead acid battery is the right height to support it on the bench so that the tubes don't have to sit down on the bench. There are a lot more wires than there really have to be because everything's in these little twisted sets. But that's because of the kind of pots we used. It's much easier to solder a single wire to each pin than anything else. So we went with this method. Ends up being much easier to put together and looking better. And everything's all bunched up over here. There's not one single component that got a piece of wire soldered to one of its pins. Everything fit. Now I've got that 200K resistor for V1B, which is actually V2A. And I said it wrong earlier. I got the overdrive switch and I got the indicator light and I put the capacitor right across the overdrive control because I didn't put in that resistor that I was going to put in and I'll explain that in a second. That's what the front end looks like now with the new overdrive switch and the LED. I don't know what I'm going to do with that hole. I think I'll just leave it. it looks pretty good like that. I'm not even going to clean that dirt off because it's not like the cabinet's going to suddenly be nice. It's got a nice weathered appearance here and touch this right after I powered it down to install that indicator light and that switch and I accidentally laid my hand right there on the audio transformer while touching the chassis and it shocked the crap out of me man. And here we are at the end of the video where the boring technical explanations are. This is the updated schematic. This is different from the one that I showed earlier but I'm gonna leave that one in just to troll the people who only watch half the video. If you want to build this for real, this is the actual schematic of the amp I built. But I want to tell you about some things. A little upside down star next to that capacitor right there, and that capacitor. Those capacitors were added because on the breadboard, this thing was an oscillator until they were installed. But they probably aren't necessary once it's in the chassis. I don't know, you're just going to have to find out for yourself. But that's what those were there for. They're oscillation stopping capacitors that I installed because it squealed when it was on the breadboard and stopped once it was in the amp. Speaking of squealing, this amp is intentionally capable of oscillating. If you turn the overdrive on and crank everything up, it probably won't do any oscillating with nothing hooked to it. But if you so much as plug a guitar cable into it and you're going to be hearing whistling and squealing and stuff, that's on purpose because that's the music style that we like. Overdrive, the power amp overdrive as I'm calling it, is just bypassing a 100k resistor that's in series with the volume pot. It adds like 1% or less to the actual loudness of the amp, but it noticeably changes the sound of a guitar when everything is turned up all the way. And the overdrive over here, that's a pretty major change from what I initially had done. It's not an overdrive switch, it's an overdrive control. It's just a 250k pot parallel with a 1 nanofarad capacitor that's in series with the gain control. Another thing that I added because of oscillations. On the breadboard, when everything was maxed out, the gain was so high that if there was no resistance here, it would squeal. And if there was no resistance here, it would squeal. But we wanted its ability to squeal. We made a point to make sure it could squeal once it was completed. So. You can do that differently, but if you do copy this exact schematic, know that it might oscillate in overdrive. If you don't like that, maybe don't build this one. There was also an error on this page. This 200K does not tie here, it ties here after the second filter. 
but otherwise this one was actually right. The power supply schematic also has a few notes on it about oscillation. No ground causes oscillation. See there? What we're talking about is the filament circuit. If you don't ground the filament circuit, it doesn't do that in the amp chassis. It never oscillates no matter what you do to the filaments once it's actually installed in the chassis. But on the breadboard, thanks to all these crazy wires everywhere that, you know, it's cleaned up a little bit because this is a different circuit, but you saw it before. All those extra wires add so much inductance to the circuit that it makes unpredictable things happen. The wrong ground does still cause a hum. I'm grounding the red wire behind the indicator light. That's how that's working. It doesn't show the indicator on here right now, but that's all it is though. It's just an LED. I didn't bother with a diode or nothing, Jesus. It, it doesn't flicker noticeably, it's okay. So anyways, if you're gonna run the heaters on 12 volts, I found that pin four of the tubes caused the quietest hum. And on 24 volts AC, I found that pin four of the first tube being grounded yielded the least hum. The amp does still hum a little bit because I have not obsessively probed around for the best ground. And I'm not going to because the hum doesn't bother me. This is the material list now. This is what's actually in there right now. It too is different from what's there before. Now these voltages up here on these capacitors, sometimes these capacitors will just randomly short if you give them more voltage than they're intended to have. I had one explode on me while I was breadboarding the amp. It was like a 10 volt rated cap and I put 300 volts across it and it exploded. It's just an example of what not to do. Now this one down here is 63 volts, the one microfarad. The only ones that are one microfarad in this circuit are this one here on the bias resistor that sees a couple of volts and these over here on the low impedance input that literally see less than one volt. Those are the only capacitors in here that I installed that are rated less than the B plus voltage. And you should do that too. Also worthy of note that the treble pot, turn it down to lower the resistance. You know, opposite the way that we have the base wired. If you don't do that, your treble knob will be backwards. That's it for the technical documents. That's it right there, just these three pieces of paper. That's what we use. You might want to know what transformer this is. Each one of these transformers has a primary on this side, 3500 ohms, and a secondary down here of 9 ohms. I have the primaries in series to make about 7000 ohms, and I have the secondaries in parallel to make about 4.5 ohms. And that is our audio output transformer that we're using. It's about half as much primary resistance as the minimum resistance for these tubes. So it stands to reason that this is not the best choice, but it's what we're using. I did mention why I changed that transformer. Uh, this, this is a 75VA transformer, and this is a 40VA transformer. That one that I was going to use worked, but it got a little hotter than I would have liked. So I switched it out with this one that only gets warm. You could probably get away with a 40VA. 50VA would definitely be fine. 75 is overkill, but look at it. You see what I'm saying? And with that, this is now the third act amplifier. We're not going to remove the foil tape. We're not going to shine up this authentic real leather. We're not going to take the mask and take it off the side. None of it. It's going to stay just like this as a satanic induction model 321, otherwise known as the third act. The first in a series of cheap bullshit practice amplifiers to be turned into proper tube amps using random stuff. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't recommend that you now go watch a Fran Lab video or Shango 066 video or Mr. Carlson's lab video or one of the old classics from photonic induction that somebody out there didn't know whether or not I knew about. Can you imagine?